let's assume that we have a die, a symmetric die, which has six sides. If I ask you, I throw this, and it's a symmetric fair die. If I ask you, what is the chance that I throw it and I get a three? Can you answer me? One in six. Yeah, and I don't have to teach you. The process that goes into your mind is this. You think about this. What are the total number of possibilities that may come out? Then you think to yourself, so you think about the total number of possibilities. And then you think, okay, there are six possibilities. And you know that because this, I told you that this die is symmetric, you know that all of these six sides have the same chance. And only one of those chances will make you happy. Only three, which one of these sides that have similar chance can make you happy. Therefore, you will say, okay, only one of those things can make me happy. Therefore, the chance that I will be happy is one over six. Because five out of these six things will not make me happy. Only one of them will make me happy. And this is, the, this is called classical probability. In classical probability, like we use our, it's just a translation of human intuition to a formal definition of probability. I can ask you more questions, like more complex questions. What is the chance that we will get an odd number? 50%. Uh, uh, notice that probability is a number between 0 and 1 and uh, cannot become more than 1 because at most is that total number of possibilities will make us happy. So the maximum is that denominator is 7, numerator is 7, would be 7 out of 7. And we always write the denominator first. So I ask you, what is the chance that we will get an odd number? What happens in your mind is that first, you will think, what are the total number of ways that this die can land? In the denominator. Six. Very good. Then you think, how many of those will make me happy? Three. And I can ask the question, more complicated questions, like with uh, logical operations between these properties. For example, I can say, what is the chance that I will get four or odd? Uh, let's say six or odd, okay? So what is the total number of possibilities? See. Uh, yeah, I throw the die. There are six possibilities. And how many of them will make me happy? Four. So you see, again, for classical probability, we actually need, uh, we don't need to teach people. It's just an intuition, okay? Uh, but uh, most of the time in real life business, uh, classical probability doesn't work. Uh, for example, if I ask you, what is the chance that the, a customer in store will buy. So you have a, a customer in your store and I ask you, look, what is the chance that the customer will buy? Can you tell me what is the probability? Um, yeah. What is it? Uh, it's empirical probability. Yeah, no, I want the number. Yes, uh, this is, in this case, this is not classical probability. It yeah. is empirical, it is called empirical probability. Um, so, but tell me, what is the chance that the customer will buy? Um, we have to... What are the total the number, number of possibilities? Buy or no buy? Yeah, so there are two possibilities. But... Um, do they have similar chance? Like in the case of a die, the chance of getting 
one, two, three, six, four, they were all the same. Is the chance of buying and not buying the same? No. So notice that there is nothing in the symmetry of the shape of the situation when the customer is in the store. Um, you know, we don't know which of the outcomes has what chance. So in this case, we cannot use the classical probability. Even if you write the denominator as two, you don't know, uh, you cannot use that uh, by uh, uh, the classical probability because the outcomes don't have similar chance. If I would add that the chance that the person would buy, uh, chance of buying and not buying is the same, then it becomes the classical probability. You have two outcomes, you have similar chance, and then the probability is total possibilities in the denominator, what makes us happy in the numerator. But because we don't know that the two outcomes have the similar chance, we cannot use classical probability. So I give you more information. Last week, 258 customers came to store and 68 of them bought a product, okay? Now, the empirical probability says, count the total number of observations now in this case, and count the total number of ways that it happened that made you happy. And that gives you a probability. So how many observations we have had? 258. How many of them make us happy? 68. Please do the division. 26.3565%. Six six percent. Sorry. Okay, I didn't notice that probability is a number between zero and one. You can convert it to a percentage, but uh, when you do the division, it would be a decimal like this, right? Which you later can convert if you are asked to a percentage. But the probability itself is a number between zero and one. Can this uh, empirical probability be more than one? No. Yeah, so that's the extreme case is that 258 people came to the store and all of the 258 people bought it. So it has all of the attributes of classical probability. You know, there's also an option that 258 people came to the store and none of them bought it. Okay. So it is very similar to classical probability with a major difference. So in the past week, 26% of people bought your product. So will that happen that in the next week also 26% of people will buy your product? Are we sure? No. no. That's the difference. Like here in the classical probability, we have to assume that the shape is symmetric. So assumptions are from the geometrical or physical shape of the situation, the nature of the situation. In the empirical probability, the assumption is that what has happened in the past will continue in the future. So just imagine that we are assuming that there is something in the mind of all of the customers that makes 26% uh, of them susceptible of buying this product. Okay. Or you can say in the population, 26% of people actually love our product. So something is happening in the phenomena that causes this, what has happened in the past to happen in the future. Okay. Notice that you cannot rely on empirical probability without this assumption. Similar, you cannot rely on classical probability without assuming that the shape is symmetric. Yes. Yeah. So we have two types of probability. 
But in both kinds of probability, we have to do counting. There is a lot of counting involved here. We have to count the total number of uh, ways that uh, things can happen. We have to count the total number of ways that we can become happy. So here the counting is very important. So the first part of chapter four focuses on counting. Without being able to count, we won't be able to basically answer the probability questions. Now, let's say we, there is a person who wants to go from city A to city B, and then wants to go from city B to city C, and there are highway one, two, three between city A and B, and highways, okay, let's say five highways here, uh, four, five, six, seven, eight, connecting city B to city C, okay? And the question that is asked for you is, in how many different ways a random traveler, let's say a salesperson, a random traveler, a person who doesn't prefer any of these roads, can randomly go from city A to city C, okay? So in how many different ways? Can choose the highways, okay? What's your answer? 15. Uh, how many? 15. Why? Because there are like, uh, three no, three ways of arrangement from A to B and the five ways. So, for example, he may choose Highway One, right? Yeah. If he chooses Highway One, then reaches to City B, and from there he may choose Highway Four, he may choose Highway Five, Highway Six, Highway Seven, and Highway Eight. So, if he chooses Highway One for the first choice, there are five possibilities. Yeah. If he chooses highway two, then there is also five possibilities. And it turns out that the total number of possibilities is three multiplied by five, which is 15, okay? Basically, this is called multiplication rule. If you can do something in M ways and something else in N ways, then the total number of ways that you can do these, and these two M and N are independent, so basically they are randomly selected. If, you, if two actions are happening one after the other, one in M ways and the other in N ways, the total ways that can happen is M multiplied by N. Okay? This rule is the fundamental rule of counting, and there are some specific situations that this count, uh, kind of counting happens. Uh, for example, um, imagine that we have a number of candidates uh, whom we are randomly giving them a prize. And the prize is that they have to go to a travel. Uh, some of them will go to a very you know, lovely city and some of them would be sent to a city that is not that lovely. Uh, just give me the name of a city that you would, it's very desirable for people to go to. Paris. Very good. So, the, you know, one of the people who are selected will go to Paris. Give me a less desirable city. Give me a city that is not desirable to be sent to. Edmonton. Edmonton is not desirable. Okay, uh, Saskatchewan or Saskatoon. Okay, help me in the spelling. Sas. K A. Saskatoon. Yeah. Right. And give me a city that is desirability is between the two. Toronto. Very good. So these are the three cities that they will be sent. And the people are A, B, so Alan, Bob, Charlie, David. 
So there are six people, and let's say five people, for numerical reason, okay? So there are five people, and we are choosing three of them to go to these three cities. In how many, uh, so we want to know in how many different ways this can happen, okay? And let's say we are interested in what is the chance that randomly BCD is selected? What is the chance that Bob will go to Paris and Charlie will go to Toronto and David will go to Saskatchewan? But uh, uh, to find the probability, we have to find the total number of possibilities, put it in the denominator, then the one that we want in the numerator, and that gives us. So anyway, we will end up needing to know what is the total number of ways that we can send people to this destination. So let's use the multiplication formula. In how many different ways we can choose the first person? Five. In how many different ways we can choose the second person? Five. Four. No, so, no, no, think about this. If I've chosen a person and he's sitting in an airplane going, going to Paris, Four. we cannot send that person to Toronto anymore. So after making the first choice, the total number of possibilities for the second choice is? Four. Four. And after we chose the person who goes to Paris and the person goes to Toronto, how many choices we have for Saskatchewan? Three. Three. And based on multiplication rule, this is the total number of ways that we can choose people to go to uh, these three destinations. Notice that if you don't believe in that, you can write it down. So you can say the first choice is A, B, C. The second choice is A, C, B. Then we have A, B, D, A, D, B, A, C, B. Oh, we, A, C, B we already had. So you have to write down all of the possibilities um, for uh, also C, D, A, C, E, A, D, E. So you have to write it down. And it turns out that, you know, we benefit from multiplication rule. And this is the total number of possibilities. Now, mathematicians, uh, want to convert this to a formula. So they say, if the answer is this, do you agree that multiplying this by two and dividing by two, I'm not changing anything? Yeah. Do you agree that if I multiply by one in the numerator and denominator, I'm not changing anything? Yeah. So they say that we can write the answer to this question as 5 factorial divided by 2 factorial. Factorial, like 6 factorial is 6 multiplied by 5, multiplied by 4, multiplied by 3, multiplied by 1. So basically, uh, we converted that result that we knew to a formula, which is n factorial divided by... Where is this two coming from? Okay, let's try another question so you may be able to guess what is that n, okay? Let's say we have uh, six people and we are choosing four of them to go to different cities. So Paris, Toronto, Saskatchewan, and I don't know, Jingulia, okay? So in how many different ways I can choose the first person? Six. Six. Second person? Five. Four and three. Then I have to multiply that. Do you agree that I didn't change anything? Yes. Do you agree that I didn't change anything? Yeah. So it turns out to be 6 factorial divided by 2 factorial. So what is this denominator? It's half 
how many is left in the, exactly. the sequence? Yes, very good. So basically the denominator, if you are choosing R options, if you are choosing R out of N, then it is N minus R. How many is left? So there are five objects, five factorial, and we are choosing three of them. So five minus three factorial. In this case, six factorial divided by six, because we are choosing four objects, six minus four factorial, okay? This formula is called permutation. Notice that it's not that different from the multiplication rule. Just we multiply numerator and denominator to convert it to a factorial. Nothing special about permutation. Good? Yeah. Well, I'm your one. Um, on the top of the numerator, why, if the, the bottom is how many are left, then what is the times by two and by one at the end of the numerator? Uh, repeat your question. Um, the two, the, cause you go six times five times four times three, because you know, that's all the, you know, the people can go. Yeah. So actually the actual answer is this. So, but, so what's, what is the, does times two and times one change the answer or what? No, no, just that the mathematicians want to find what is the formula. So they multiply numerator and denominator by two, then multiply numerator and denominator by one. And they say, okay, we didn't change anything. But then the numerator six multiplied by five, multiplied by four, multiplied by three, multiplied by two, multiplied by one is six factorial. It just codifies the answer. Okay. We, they are not changing anything. Now let's think about a different scenario. There are A, B, C, D, E. And we want to form a team. In how many different ways we can form a team of three people? In how many different ways I can choose the first person? Five. Five. In how many different ways I can choose the second person? Four. And the third person? Three. But this is not the answer. Why? Because if I choose A, B, C, then all of the shuffling of A, B, C would be the same team. It doesn't matter like A, B, C and A, C, B and B, C, A. These are all the same team. In this case, order doesn't matter. So the total number of teams is not actually five multiplied by four multiplied by three. In the previous question, if we would choose A, B, C, A would go to Paris. If we choose B, C, A, B would go to Paris. So these are two different choices. But when we are forming a team, the order doesn't matter. So we have to take out all of the shufflings of A and B and C or the shuffling of three things. So let's think about this. If the, let's say we chose uh, these people, X, Y, and Z, the three people are selected. All of the shuffling of these three people should be uh, uh, took out. And the shufflings will end up to be, um, you know, the, like I'm, if I want to find out in how many different ways I can shuffle them, I can choose the first option in three ways. I can choose the second option in two ways. And I can choose the third option in one way. So basically the total number of ways that I can shuffle X, Y, Z in different orders would be their permutation, right? All of these permutations or different orderings of X, Y, Z in this case, they are the same. So I have to divide this by six to get the right answer. Now, but let's, uh, let's do this. First of all, this have to be divided by three factorial to get rid of the shufflings. 
Good? Yeah. I have to make sure. Emily? Emily? Yeah. Okay, why are we dividing this by three factorial? Um, because you don't want to have the same, I don't know how to explain it in perfect words, but if you're making a team, if it if you have A, B, C, or B, C, A, it's still the exact same team. So you have we to don't want to double count. Yeah. We, or triple count. We want to take out all of the various ways that A, B, C, A, C, B, B, C, A, C, B, A, these are all the same thing. We have to cancel them out. So we take out all of the six ways that each one of these, like even C, D, E, can be written in six different ways. Okay? C, D, E, C, E, D, E, D, C, D, C, E. There are six different ways that they can be shuffled. So for every combination, we have to cancel all of the other six combinations. We have to just count them as one. That's why we divide by three factorial. But we already know that five multiplied by four multiplied by three can be written as n factorial divided by n minus r factorial. And this three factorial is basically r factorial. So we can write this five multiplied by four multiplied by three as five factorial. We have five options and then n minus r, two factorial, because there are r in this case is three, and r factorial, three factorial. Or you could simply say five multiplied by four multiplied by three divided by three factorial, that's the same thing. This is called combination. And you don't have to memorize this. Notice that these formulas, you don't have to memorize. But you have to understand these are nothing other than, so permutation is nothing other than multiplication rule, and combination is nothing other than taking out all of the similarities out of the multiplication rule. Good so far? Yeah, so would you say that um, you use combinations when the order doesn't matter? Exactly. Okay. And there is one more situation that can happen. We have uh, A, B, C, D, E sitting in a class and they are going to get an Amir dollar. And today I'm going to give them three Amir dollars. Now in how many different ways you know, I say answer this question and then you'll get an Amir dollar when you answer. In how many different ways the first person may end up to be? Five. Yeah, there are five persons. Like each one of these five people can get the first Amir dollar. In how many different ways the second Amir dollar can be given? Five. Five or four? Four. Four. Like, did I ever say that if you get an Amir dollar, I won't give you another one? No. no. So if you get an Amir dollar, do you stay in the domain of possibilities for the next Amir dollar? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So you stay in the domain of possibilities. So in how many different ways the second Amir dollar can be given? Five. And the third one? Five. Same. So in this case, the formula, if, if, you are, if I'm giving R Amir dollars, the total number of ways that it can be given is n to the power of r. Notice that the Amir dollar can go to a, 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 like all of the Amir dollars goes to the same person. And it's also possible that a, b, a, or a, a, b, so all of these are possible. Right? So let me summarize all of the possibilities because a lot of questions in this chapter, like half of the questions are about counting. 
and counting is essential for calculation of the probability. So what can happen? In general, there are two possibilities. Okay? One is that the phenomena is that you are randomly selecting with replacement in the domain of possibilities. Or you can summarize that as saying that repetition is allowed. So you are, when you are, just take a note of this diagram that I'm going to draw for you, and then making a decision about permutation, combination, or n to the power of r would be easy for you. The other possibility is that you are selecting or counting without replacement in the domain of possibilities, or we say repetition is not allowed, okay? So if repetition is allowed, what is the formula? Um. If M like Amir dollar. Like Amir dollar. And N factorial over R factorial. No, no, just no. It's just N to the power of R. Okay. Now, if repetition is not allowed, like you are not putting it in the domain of possibilities, like the first person who goes to Paris, is he still in the domain of possibilities? No. No. So in that case, two situations can happen. Either order matters or order does not matter, okay? If order matters, this is a situation of Paris, Toronto, and so forth, so different cities, and it matters if you choose the first or first or second. A, B, C, and B, C, A is different. In that case, we use permutation. And if order doesn't matter, as one of your classmates nicely summarized, it is called combination. So if order matters, the total number of possibilities is <clears throat> a big, relatively big number. But when order does not matter, then a lot of them gets canceled. So it would be a smaller count, n minus r factorial, similar to the permutation, when we have to cancel out r factorial of them. All of the combinations of, you know, all of the variations of those r things should go out. But other than counting, we have other interests. Uh, you know, we, not only we want to be able to calculate the probabilities, but we want also to be, to do operations with probabilities. What is the chance that this and that happen? What is the chance that this or that happen? So for that, I want you to imagine a group of people who are in a room some of them are male and some of them are female. Some of them are from North Van and some of them are from West Van. Let's say they are three, four, five, six people. Okay. Three people are male and they are from North Van. Four people are female from North Van. Six people are male from West Van and so forth. So this, this is called a contingency table. And in a contingency table, we give the breakdown of all of the people who are in that population. How many people are in that room? 18. Let's say if I tell you that I want to randomly choose these people, so I close my eyes and I randomly choose the name of one of these people, 
I ask you, what is the chance that a randomly selected person is a female? Can you answer that question? What is the probability that a randomly selected person is a female? 50%. This is classical probability. And in classical probability, we always write the denominator. So we count the total number of uh, possibilities. So if I randomly choosing a person, how many possibilities are there? In how many different ways I can choose the one person? 18. Very good. So 18 goes to the denominator. And how many of them will make us happy? Nine. Very good. Also, I can ask you a question like this. What is the chance that a randomly selected person is from Westwell? Uh, 11 over 18. You always write the denominator first. So 18. Uh, 18 is the total number of possibilities. And how many of these, you know, if I randomly choose, how many can make me happy? 11. Very good. Okay. Now, I also can ask you other questions. For example, I can ask you, what is the chance that a person selected is not from Westman. In how many different ways we can choose a person? Eight. In total? 18. Eighteen. And I'm not interested in Westman. So in how many different ways I can be happy? Seven. Uh, how, how many? Seven. Seven, yes, okay. And it turns out that this is equal to one minus the probability of selecting someone from Westman. So that would be one minus selecting from Westman. The probability is 11 over 18. This is 18 over 18 minus 11 over 18, which would be 7 over 18. So, so far, we found one formula. The formula is that the probability of not, not, this is called tilt sign, x is 1 minus probability of x. Probability of not x. This, this is a symbol uh, called tilt. Okay, thank it's you. Not X. Now, uh, I can also ask you, what is the probability of selecting, randomly selecting a person who ends up to be female or from West Vancouver? Uh, in how many different ways I can choose a person? 18. Very good. And how many of them will make me happy? 15. Very good. Because, look at this. If I choose this, anyone from this group, will it make me happy? Yeah. Yeah. The, the person is a man. Will it make me happy? Yes, because he's from West Bank. Very good. If I choose a person from this group randomly, will it make me happy? Yeah. Why? Because it's female. Yeah. Even though it's from North Van, I will be happy. If I choose a person from this group, will I be happy? Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm very happy because it's both female and from West Bank. So so th this is the answer. Now it turns out that this answer is identical to doing this. If I find the probability of female and I add the probability of someone from West Van, and then I subtract the probability of female 
and best man, let's see what happens. What is the probability of female? 9 over 18. We already calculated that. Plus, what is the probability of randomly choosing from best man? 11, 11 out of 18. Now, uh, this one we didn't calculate. Minus, what is the probability of female and best man? In how many different ways we can select a person? Five. I mean, 18 and... 18. And how many of them are female and West man? Five. 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 And it turns out we have a common denominator. 9 plus 11 is 20, minus 5 is 15. So notice that the result would be exactly the same thing. And why this happens? The reason is that when I'm calculating the probability of female, I, in the numerator, I get both of these females. When I'm calculating the probability of West Van, I'm counting all of the people who are in West Van. So these people who are female and from West Van, if I add this and this, they're counted twice. So I have to take out a double count, you know, because we counted this group of people twice, then we get the right answer. Good? Yes. So here we get a new formula. The probability of A or B is probability of A plus probability of B but we have to subtract the double count. Sometimes there is a double count, sometimes there is not. But if there is a double count, we have to take it out. Good? Yep. Now, I can ask another question. Let me zoom out instead of scrolling. Okay. Zoom out. So you still have that chart. Now I can ask you, what is the probability of North Van and male? How do we answer this question? I'm randomly choosing a person. What is the chance that that person ends up to be a male from North Van? Three out of 18. Yeah, we always write the denominator face first. So in how many different ways we can choose that person? 18. 18. And how many of them are male and North Van? Three. Three. So 3 out of 18 can make me happy. The answer is 3 over 18. Now, the beautiful thing is that I can write this, I can find the same answer by finding probability of North Van multiplied by probability of male. If I know, this is called conditional probability. We draw a vertical line. If I know that the person is from North Van. So basically the probability of North and male is that it's a, someone from North, and of those who are from North, we want only the male ones. It turns out that it will give us exactly the same answer. Let's try that. What is the chance that we randomly select someone from North Van? Uh, the total number of ways that we can select someone 18. How many of them are from North Van? Seven. Seven. So this is the probability of selecting someone from North Van. Multiplied by. We know that, notice that what we write at the right side of this vertical is what has happened. So if we know that the person is from North Van, what is the chance that that person is a male? 
So for calculating this, we know that the person is from North Van. So how many options we have? Seven. Seven. The total number of possibilities are those seven people who are from North Van. And how many of them are male? Three. Three. And it turns out that it is three over 18. Not only that, but I can write the probability of North Van and male is the probability of male multiplied by the probability that I know that the person is male and I calculate the chance that it is from North Van. So notice that this, this is how we write it. The probability of something and the probability of the other thing if we already know that the first thing has happened. Let's do that. What is the probability of selecting a male? Total number of possibilities? 18. How many of them are male? Nine. Very good. Multiply by. Now we want to find the chance of North Van if we already know that the person is male. So if we know that the person is male, how many options we have? Nine. Nine. And out of those nine, how many can make me happy? Three. Three. And it turns out that it is three over 18. So it gives us the answer. So we have a new for, two new formulas. Uh, probability of A and B is probability of A multiplied by probability of B when A has already happened, conditional to A, and we can also write it as probability of B multiplied by probability of A if we know that B has already happened. Think about this, and you see it's so natural. Like A and B, if both A and B is happening, it means that B must for sure happening, and A should happen when B has happened. So this is basically a very logical statement. Um, I showed you, not, I didn't prove it for you, but I showed you that it will give you the same result as it should based on classical probability. But sometimes the questions that we ask can be very complicated. And in many, many situations, drawing the probability tree will help us to easily answer a question. Let's look at this question. 40% of students get, let's say 40% of the students pass the course. And of those who pass the course, thirty percent get a plus. No, let's say, not get a plus. Let's say they get a prize. Sixty percent of I don't have to tell you. So sixty percent of the students, of course, don't pass the course. Of those who do not pass. The course, 5% still get the prize. Because the prize is for social interaction, for example. Okay. Now, there are some easy questions and there are hard questions. Let me ask you an easy question. What is the chance that a person 
passes the course and gets the prize. Zero point one two. Yeah, what was the formula you used? Zero point four times zero point three. Oh, that is not the formula. So the formula is probability of passing multiplied by probability of prize. If we know that the person has passed, do we know what is the probability of passing? Forty percent. If a person has passed, what is the chance of getting the prize? 30%. And that gives us the answer. Now, there are questions that are hard. For example, what is the chance that a person gets no prize? Is this easy? The a structured answer to this question is this. We draw a starting point and we think about what are the two pro probabilities that we know. And it turns out that based on this question, we know that 40% of the people pass, so we know that the probability of passing is 40%, and we immediately know that the probability of not passing is 60%. So we draw these two branches like that. And then we think, okay, when we are at this point, we know that the person has passed. Okay. Do we know what is the chance of prize if the person has passed? Yeah, point one, two. No, the chance of prize if the person has passed. Point three. Yeah, point three. Very good. Do we know what is the chance of not prize if the person has passed? Point seven. Very good. So we complete this diagram. And then here, do we know what is the chance of prize if the person has not passed? Do we know this? Yeah. Point zero five. Point, point point zero five. Do we know the chance of prize, chance of not getting the prize if the person has not passed? Point nine five. Point nine. So basically, this tree will give us four branches that shows all of the possibilities. Now, if I multiply this 0 0.4 by 0 0.3, this will give me the probability of pass and prize, which we already calculated. Right? Yeah. Probability of pass multiplied by price if pass. This would be probability of pass multiplied by not prize if pass. So this would be probability of pass and not prize, right? Probably just notice that based on the formula, we have probability of pass 0.4 multiplied by probability of not prize if we know the pass and it's the AND formula. So if we multiply these things, 0.6 multiplied by 0 0.05, this gives me the probability of not pass and getting prize, uh, prize, and 0.6 multiplied by 0.95 is probability of not pass and not prize. Good? Yes. Yeah. So basically the branches of this tree gives us all of the AND possibilities. Now the question that was hard was the probability of no prize. Okay. 
Once you have this probability tree, answering that question is very easy. Let's think about this. We want no prize. Are we interested in this? Do you see my pen? No. Are we interested in this outcome? No. No. Are we interested in this outcome? Yeah. Why? Because it's no prize. Very good. Are we interested in this outcome? No. No. Are we interested in this outcome? Yeah. So you see, once you have the decision, the probability tree, you simply circle what makes you happy, you add them, and that's the answer.